Good afternoon. We're here this afternoon at the Morse Institute Library in Natick, Massachusetts, continuing with our Veterans Oral History Project. This afternoon, November 23rd, 1998, we have the pleasure of inter interviewing Mr. John K. Carlo. Good afternoon, Mr. Carlo. Oh, good afternoon. How are you? Very well, thanks. Delighted Can, to be here. Thank you. Can I ask you a little uh, background information before we start okay, in the means, uh, right. interview itself? Uh, you still live in Natick? Live in Natick. We've lived in Natick since 1954. And you are married? Yes. How long have you been married? Uh, since 1954. And your wife? What is that, 44 years? Mm -hmm. And my wife is uh, Marianne, or Mickey Carlo, who's on the staff here at the library. Yes. Very nice staff member, I might add. And do you have children? We have two children, a uh, son, James, and a daughter, Anne. Uh, we had them late. I was 44 when, when Anne was born. Really? And Mickey was 40. So our daughter, Anne, is just getting married uh, within the year. Our, our son has been married for seven or eight years. And any grandchildren? Uh, but no grandchildren yet. Not yet. Where were you born, Mr. Carlo? I was born and raised in North Adams. North which Adams, is the, Mass. The heart of uh, Northern Berkshire, a mill town that uh, never has done that well to begin with. And, uh, and in 1998, it's, uh, it's a disaster, I guess. But I was born and raised there. And tell us a little bit about your family in North Adams. My father uh, had an eighth, gr eighth grade education, uh, but he became a, a successful businessman. He had a cigar factory, and uh, he always felt shortchanged that he could never get more education. It was a ne necessity that he leave. And he uh, ran for school committee my first year and uh, was still on the school committee when I graduated in grade 12. Really? And an influential member of the school committee, mainly because of his interest in education, I think. And that interest, did that fall on your shoulders also, that you should have a good education? It sure did. In what way? Well, they had, when I graduated from high school, of course, I got drafted, but they had set aside enough money for college, they, they thought it was going to be enough, you know, uh, that he'd put, put aside for me, which was awaiting me when I, uh, I got out of the service. But then I had the GI Bill, so I used that money for graduate school. So. Were you an only child? I had an older brother that died of polio before I was born, so for all intents and purposes, I was an on, only child. And what about your mother? My mother uh, was a housewife, and uh, uh, she was a junior in high school, and her mother died. And she had to leave school because to, to be the housewife in the family, because there was a younger brother and a couple of older siblings that were working, and so she was the one, and she always regretted that, too. So both parents, having had difficulties with regards to their own education, made sure that your future in education well, would be taken care yes. of. Interesting. Yes. When did you enter the military? Okay, I graduated from uh, Drury High, which is the local high school in North Adams, in June of 1944. The war had been on two and a half years. Uh, in fact, our graduation occurred just about the same time as the D-Day invasion. Um, the, uh, and I went in the service in September 1944. Was the, I, I'm sorry. Okay, when I went in, the, uh, my older friends would go and take basic training, and then they would join a division, say. And that when they went overseas, they'd go overseas in that division. By the time I got in, most of the divisions were overseas. So I was told that I was going to be a replacement uh, for somebody either killed or wounded in action 
uh, either in Europe or the Far East. And, uh, and we knew that from day one when we got there. Uh, after I left Fort Devens, at Fort Devens you process and then you're sent someplace. And I was sent to uh, Spartanburg, South Carolina. And the name of the camp was Camp Croft. And it was just called an IRTC, Infantry Replacement Training Center. Because that's where the casualties were in World War II at that point in time. They, the general staff had expected the losses to be at a certain level, Air Force, Navy, Marine, and Army. And as far as the Army was concerned, their casualties in the infantry companies were higher than they had anticipated and less in some of the other uh, areas. So you were Army infantry? Right. When I uh, went in, I had no choice. That's where the military's needs were. And uh, I was an 18-year-old kid, but uh, they loved us. <laughs> we uh, were in reasonable uh, physical condition. If the sergeant told us to do something, we did it. We were too afraid not to. And uh, we had a, a, a strong sense of our own immortality. You see how 18-year-olds drive today? Mm -hmm. uh, so the Army loved people like me. In fact, most of the people that went in, you know, the time I went in were uh, 18. Did you have uh, any friends from North Adams go in with you? Uh, there were people that went in with me, then we just uh, went our different ways. Mm -hmm. uh, so I did uh, meet a classmate of mine. Uh, after the war had ended, we were moving out of Germany back to uh, France in boxcars. That's how they transported troops back then, back then. And we stopped at a siding, and another train came by and stopped. And I'm standing in the doorway. And standing in the doorway of the other car was a classmate of mine. Did you recognize each other? Oh, did we ever. But then the train started to move. <laughs> but it didn't go very far. So we had quite a reunion. He had gone in uh, before me uh, in high school. If you turned 18 during the first semester, which would be from, say, September to the end of January, you were, you were gone. So you they didn't let you, they didn't let you stay for graduation. They gave you uh, your diploma. And in fact, my yearbook, we have, there are five or six people in uniform in the yearbook, which is, uh, a, a, a fact I think a lot of people weren't aware of. Getting back to your 18-year-old feelings of immortality, right. um, but there had to be fear also going in, knowing that you were replacing casualties. Yes. Tell us how, how, in learning about that, what, what your sense was. Uh, there was always fear. Um, like the first few days, artillery shells, you, I couldn't tell whether they were coming in or going out. Uh -huh. But after a while, you got to know from the sound which, which are the ones to be worried about. And you're in a foxhole, which makes you reasonably safe unless the shell lands right on top of you, and then you're in trouble. That type of fear. Getting uh, back to after basic training and being in Camp Croft, was this your first trip to the south? Yes. Mm -hmm. And how long were you there for? Okay, this is also interesting. It was supposed to be 17 weeks. It was a regular infantry training time that they had developed uh, through the years. During our 12th week, we were out in bivouac, which is uh, sleeping out in the field under pup tents. And uh, we're ready to, for our full field 25-mile hike. You know, in the infantry, you, you walk a lot. And uh, we're getting ready for that. And suddenly, the uh, uh, sergeant uh, came by, our platoon sergeant, and said, OK, pack up. We're going back to company headquarters. And, uh, and no 25-mile hike, just went right back straight. And we didn't know what was going on. And we got back, and every one of us had orders to report to Fort Meade, Maryland. 
which was a processing depot for guys going overseas. Uh, I think maybe just to Europe. I'm not sure of that. The Battle of the Bulge had broken. This was December 1944. And uh, the, uh, the army, which can be very cumbersome and inefficient until a big crisis occurs, and boy, do they become efficient. They needed people. And somebody looked at us, well, they've had 12 weeks. Send them over. So had right. you heard about the Battle of the Bulge at no. that point? Okay. No, we had not. So you went to Fort Meade, you got your papers to go overseas. I did get home. I, uh, from Fort, to get to Fort Meade, they gave us a week. So I got home for a couple of days. And then uh, the, uh, and I never went home again until I uh, was, was discharged. So, but, uh, but that's what happened, and, and uh, we were only there, Fort Meade, for a few days, and then we went to a camp outside New York City and got on a big ship uh, that uh, the sh ship was a former luxury liner uh, called the Manhattan, and uh, we went across. We did not go across in a convoy because the ship was too fast. And, uh, and there, you know, it zigzagged its way. We still made it over in, in seven days, zigzagging. And, and explain zigzagging in case well, people may not know. Well, because of submarines, mm -hmm. uh, that apparently was a way to, to at least neutralize the su submarine pack. But by that time in the war, we had uh, really established pretty good control in the, uh, in the oceans. That wasn't that big a concern by then. At one time, it was, you know, they were sinking their ships right and left, mm -hmm. the German uh, U-boats. Do you remember the trip over? Yes, I remember the trip over. I decided on the way over I should have joined the Navy if I could, because 90% of the GIs got sick, and I didn't get sick. <laughs> uh, so, the, but we went over, we landed in Liverpool. I said, my gosh, we're going to get more training here in England. We got on a, a train. It wasn't a boxcar this time. And uh, went south from Liverpool, sort of, in the northwest. Went south. Th that morning we looked out and there's water, the English Channel. And they took us across in uh, L what they call LSTs, landing ship tank. They also moved troops in them. Because the ship still didn't have a good port, that big ship had to land in Liverpool because there weren't any ports open in France, say, yet. Uh, La Havre Harbor was all full of uh, sunken ships, so they couldn't get in, in there. So, so you went over on the LSTs, which it's my understanding from previous interviews were flat bottomed. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, with the, were designed to, you know, uh, Landing ship tanks, in this case, move tanks from water to land, and, and where did you land in, in France? Okay, after uh, we landed in La Havre, and that was my first sign, really, of, uh, of war. La Havre had been bombed. Uh, and what do you remember when you saw it? Oh, I think, <laughs> and it, it was our feeling that the French weren't that happy to see us either, because we had we had bombed them. You know, the Germans were holed up there, and so they, the city was bombed. So. Do you remember, this was in the winter that you arrived. Yes. Do you remember, besides seeing bombed out areas, what else struck you, struck you about the, the land or the surroundings or the weather? It had been a cold winter. By the time I got there, there was no snow on the ground. But they'd had, during the bulge, they'd had a lot of problems. Uh, but after North Adams, <laughs> it was almost tropical. When North <laughs> no, Adams but being tough winters. Tough winters, yes. Sure. Uh, now, why do you think 
the French weren't happy to see you. Did, did you get that impression when seeing some of the villagers? Or? It wasn't that anybody said anything. It's just the way they looked at us. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and that wasn't necessarily true with the rest of France, but that in La Havre we felt that way. And how long were you in La Havre? Uh, 24 hours. And then t walk us through what transpired once you arrived. And okay, we, I can't remember. We stayed overnight in the camp. And then we were moved to uh, the train station and got on uh, boxcars. World War I, they called them 40 and 8s, quarantaine ou huit chevaux, 40 men or 8 horses. Uh. And in World War II, they, in Europe, they transported troops the same way. The VFW frequently at a parade will have a little steam engine going along, and it comes from the World War I time. The, uh, 40 and 8 time. And they used it again then? Right. Same they didn't system. put 40 men in there. It was about 20. Mm -hmm. But uh, so we got on and, and went through Paris. I was excited over that. And then we headed north into Belgium. Did you get to see anything of Paris? No. 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 Just from a distance. Did you know where you were going? No. Mm -hmm. They never told you anything, by the way. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, and we went through Belgium and landed up in Holland. Having arrived in Holland, the, did you then disembark from the uh, train? Yeah, and we went to what they called a repo depot, replacement depot, and we stayed overnight. That's the first time I, I never smoked in high school. But the uh, K-rations, the breakfast, lunch, and dinner K-rations, all c had four cigarettes in them. The federal government is telling this 18-year-old kid that he should smoke. <laughs> but I still didn't. But uh, at the Repo Depot, it wasn't far from the front. And I'm standing in the chow line. Uh, and you could hear the guns going off in the distance. So the fellow said to me, smoke? And I said, yeah. And I smoked for 25 years. I haven't smoked in a long time. But, the, but that's what started you that's smoking. That's what started me smoking. <laughs> the packet that you got from yeah. the, the service. Right, plus those big guns uh, often. Hearing there. those guns, was that the first time you had actually he yes. heard yes. war? You had seen the devastation right. in France, but you actually heard right. the guns. Yeah. What was that like? A combination of fear and excitement. But remember, I was 18. Now, at 21, I wouldn't have been that way. Uh, but I think I was excited, too. You know, the, the thing about World War II, we had been attacked. Uh, the day after Pearl Harbor, every recruiting office in the country had long lines of young men uh, signing up. Uh, the Japanese lobbed some shells from a, a submarine off the coast of California. There were some oil derricks that they were aiming for. They didn't, they didn't hit them. But half the country thought the Japanese were going to land on the, on the shore of California. Of course, it wasn't feasible. They couldn't possibly have done it, but we didn't know. Mm -hmm. And the, the, the very different mentality from Vietnam, for instance, the, the whole country. I had a a close friend of mine whose older brother uh, was examined and he had blood pressure, high blood pressure, and they didn't take him. His brother went upstairs and didn't talk to anybody for, for a week. He finally got it down and did uh, get in, but uh, it was just so different from uh, any other experience since then. So he did this in order to get the blood pressure down so he could go in to the, to the service. Well, he was the reason he went to this room, he was so depressed because they didn't take him. Mm -hmm. Whereas in Vietnam War, people were trying to get excused from going in in many They sure ways. were. Uh -huh. yeah, it was a war. The majority that went to Vietnam were not were on the wealthy end of the scale, frankly. Were not, right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, 
having heard the guns, did this sort of reinforce in you that you were now part of this war effort, more so than before? And, and what, mm -hmm. tra what transpired after that? Did you start moving out in Holland? Okay. Or? Uh, from the Repetep, you then got assigned. And uh, I was assigned to the uh, 75th Infantry Division, okay? And they have, there are three uh, regiments, uh, uh, 289, 290, and 291. And I was in the 289th uh, Regiment, just luck of the draw. And uh, I got up, and the sergeant said, there's your foxhole. I was sharing it with another kid who just arrived. And, uh, and nobody, we didn't get oriented. Nobody said, uh, hello, how are you? <laughs> I think the reason is they, the, the rookie that comes in who's not experienced has a greater chance of dying than the experienced one. And they didn't want to establish a friendship with this new guy because he may not be around that long. And at that time, did they ever put a rookie in with the more experienced guy? Or they was certainly the, didn't with me. So the other person in the foxhole was brand new, just like yeah. you? No. Yeah. And in your regiment, in that area of foxholes, how many were there, approximately? How many infantrymen? In the regiment itself, I thought, is it 3,000 per regiment? I'm not sure of that, that figure. And I was assigned to Company K. Okay. And how many would be in a company? A couple hundred. So did you know your sergeant, or was this the first time you had met him? First time I, I met him. So you're in this foxhole. Then what? We went out on night patrol. The, uh, we were on the edge of the Maas River, M-A-A-S, in Holland which becomes the Meuse River in France, by the way. And the Germans are on the other side. And that was my first chance of seeing a, a dead body uh, out on night patrol. There were, must have been 20 Germans that were trying to escape across the river, and they, whether they, they obviously had to be a, a shell or machine gun, they were all lying. They'd been there for a long time. And that, that was a bit of an eye-opener. Something you would never forget. Yeah. When that happened, I don't know, but they were still there. Do you uh, remember how you felt about that? Yeah, that, that certainly had an impact, I think, when I saw that. Was there a sense from you or the other young men that you were with that this, in fact, could be me? Uh, I'm sure it was, although it wasn't said, mm -hmm. you know. Did you talk at all amongst each other? Once we got to know one another, you know, I had a group of people I knew at basic training, and then now, but none of those are here, that you have to establish uh, friendships again, and it does, it does happen, and, you know. So you saw these, you're, you're on the Moss River. How long was your group there? I think there? we were there about 10 days, and then they crossed it. They meaning your company? Uh, no, we weren't in the first wave. Uh, we were up uh, in what the uh, the North uh, Army. Isn't that awful? I can't think of the name of the general. Simpson. And uh, there were British and Canadian regiments in the uh, Ninth Army, not the North Army, the Ninth Army. And uh, we were there right on the river and uh, had a holding position while another regiment or division built a pontoon bridge went across. And we went the, the next day. How long did it take, do you remember, for them to build the bridge? Uh, Certainly l less than a night. In other words, it happened in darkness. In the morning, it was there. <laughs> the combat engineers did that. Did that ahead of yes. time, in the middle of the night. Right. So then you had to cross this bridge? Right, in trucks. And uh, Germany wasn't far away. 
we uh, went into Germany uh, and got as far as the Rhine River. So now you're in what we would classify as true enemy territory. Without a question. And did you face a lot of direct combat there? Interestingly, the, uh, the Germans, you know, uh, had been at war since 1939. Their casualties, particularly in, in Soviet Union, were just unbelievable. Eighty percent of the German army's casualties in World War II were against the Russians. Can you imagine what it would have been like if we had to fight Germany without the Soviet Union? It's, it's unbelievable. Uh, so their losses had been terrific. They were weakened. When I got there, they were weak, uh, comparatively speaking, at least. Uh, but uh, on the other hand, they're protecting their homeland. Although I don't think they fought us as hard. See, we're coming in from the west, and the Russians are coming in from the east. And uh, if they were going to give up, they would give up to Americans before <laughs> they'd ever give up to Russians. In view of what the Germans did to, to the cities and towns in, in, in Russia. Unbelievable. So. Now, having gone into Germany, and you had also mentioned the fact that once you had landed in Le Havre, you got the sense that some of those people weren't happy to see you. What was your sense when you saw, or did you see, any of the German people in the different villages that you might be going through? It's quite, a, quite interesting. Uh, the Germans would be retreating, and they'd always put somebody with a submachine gun at a high point, and you could hold a company off quite a while uh, trying to come down the street. So they would uh, uh, retreat, and we'd, and the guy with the machine gun would either get shot or leave, and the firing would stop. We would be in the town looking for a command post and stuff like that. And out of what they called the bunker, the bunkers, came the German population waving at us and smiling at us. And they're all just, there were women, children, and old men. A few younger men who uh, only had one leg, obviously. They lost it in the war and stuff like that. But uh, uh, the war was over for them. Once the Americans came into the town and secured it, they knew no more bombing, no more shelling, no more, you know. So they, uh, that was a surprise to all of us. Mm -hmm. Could you? converse with any of them, or did you have members of your group, your unit, that spoke German? We or? did have one. I did not speak German, but mm -hmm. uh, uh, who was an interpreter for us. A lot of Germans gave up, but my squad, we took a hundred German prisoners uh, because, uh, you know, they knew the war was, was over. Uh, once but you they, took them, what did you do with them? Sent them back. I don't know. I mean, you hear these stories of prisoners being shot in uh, the uh, Private Ryan movie that just, you know, they were, of course, it was during the Battle of the Bulge, but there was, I, I saw none of that. They were, somebody took them back. To a camp? To, yes, behind the lines. Did you hear anything at that time about any of the atrocities that we now know occurred, such as the camps for the Jews or right. members of other groups? From what you could read, the, read it in the newspaper, people talk, you know. Now, none of it had been really confirmed as far as I know, but there, that information was around, that their concentration camps were death camps. But it seemed preposterous, you know, at least to me. I couldn't see how uh, civilized people like the Germans would ever do anything like that. So I never personally saw one of those camps. There were a lot of, uh, we ended up in the Ruhr, which is the industrial part of Germany. And do you know how to spell that? Right, R-U-H-R. Uh, and uh, cities such as Dusseldorf and Dortmund and uh, we were across, uh, what's the other one, Hagen, places like that, iron and steel. And uh, they brought in a lot of 
Poles and Russians uh, to work in the factories by force. You know, they lived in barracks. They could bring their families with them, their children and everything. But it was forcible labor. No question about that. So when you went into these cities, was, was it taking over the cities at that point? The Germans had given up those cities right. or were the, you just uh, passing through? We were heading, you're following the, the defeat of the Germans, mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, the, uh, occasionally, as I say, it wasn't that, that uh, compared with the Bulge just a few months before, which was terrible. 18,000 Americans killed in the Battle of the Bulge. Uh, this was much, if, if you're going to fight a war, the one I was in, not that it was great, but uh, certainly better than uh, it could have, because we, we had the upper hand. And uh, we were winning. Any close calls that you remember, or? Yeah, I, uh, I got my helmet dented once, where, the, where a bullet had uh, uh, gone over my head and hit a brick wall, and the fragments <laughs> hit. The, it, it takes a lot of force to dent those helmets, so, uh, but. Uh, but that was interesting. We were moving into a town. Suddenly, they fired on us. We all hit the ground, fired back for five, ten minutes, and a white flag went up. So I've often wondered, you know, we weren't that far away. Do you think he purposefully uh, aimed high? Uh, Knowing that he would yeah. have to surrender, right. or the smart thing to do would be to surrender. See, what they do, their uh, officers were telling them not to surrender. Mm -hmm. They w would use up their ammunition and then surrender. <laughs> And were these young men, too, that you could see? Yes, uh, either one or the other. The old guy uh, over, over 40, or young kid 16. And might the older man over 40 be the commander, or possibly right. not? Probably, although they took a lot you know, near the end when they didn't. Uh, I forget what they call them, the Vokes something, People's Army. Uh, it took a lot of real old people, but that was more in defense of uh, Berlin when the Russians were uh, on the uh, border getting ready to come in. A number of our veterans that we've interviewed talked about um, the sadness they felt in some villages seeing some of these people starving and searching for scraps from the different branches of service. Did you sense any of that or not? Uh, we were very, certainly very conscious of it, uh, although we weren't, everything moved so fast then. We didn't see civilians that, that much. The Germans were well dressed and well fed. You know, the cities had been bombed, uh, practically every building in uh, Dusseldorf was flattened. And yet the people had nice clothing, and nobody looked uh, as if they uh, hadn't eaten recently. In France, the thing I remember most when I left to come back home in June of 1946, we were at a camp outside of La Havre, ready to go on board ship. And uh, after our meal, we had these mess kits, and we'd go to the garbage pails and, and bang the mess kit and then wash it out. There were French women with buckets going in to, to for, uh, and that's, this was a year after the war. So they were still desperate for still food. Still desperate. Then. That I remember very well. Mm. So once you got up through Dusseldorf, did you keep going into Germany and then at some point turn around? How did how okay. did that go? The uh, we were in what was known as the Ruhr Pocket, uh, the third Ar Patton's Third Army had come in from the south, and the Ninth Army and the north, so there were 300,000 Germans surrounded, and that's where we ended up, mm -hmm. rounding them up, I guess you'd say. So. And it was interesting, uh, just getting into politics a little bit, that uh, a number of Germans who could speak English, after we captured them, would say to us, give us a rifle and we'll 
join you to fight the Russians. <laughs> and of course we said, are you crazy? <laughs> They're our allies. Well, a year later, the beginning of the Cold War, which lasted until 1990, unbelievable. <laughs> so there was something they knew that perhaps yeah. we didn't know at that time. So you rounded up 3,000 Germans and the war was ending. Right. And so at that point then, were they beginning to come back to ship out? It, the uh, Americans once, of course, I'm waiting. It's all, when August of 1945, I'm getting ready to be shipped, although no orders had been drawn, to the Far East for the attack uh, on uh, Japan. And they dropped the bomb which I don't think you'll find a guy from World War II who thinks that's a bad idea mm -hmm. because they had predicted that uh, there'd be a million casualties in the uh, invasion of the Japanese islands. Uh, and then you can say what you want, how immoral an atomic bomb was, but it ended the war mm -hmm. and probably in the long run uh, lives, both Japanese and uh, allied lives, uh, were saved over those that died. I find it interesting that you've fought in combat, and, and this has occurred with other veterans too. You fought in combat in Europe, and you were replacing soldiers. Right. And yet, in many instances, such as yours, the possibility was, and in other inst inst instances it did occur, that they had to go from Europe over to either the Far East or North Africa. Right. to continue on. So they went from one aspect of the war to the other. And you were yeah. willing to do that without question? Back then, uh, you didn't think you could question anything. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I wasn't looking forward to the idea, I'll tell you, but uh, I would have. So you were in Europe when the bomb was dropped. Yes. And you, you've stated that, that it, it was something that you were all in agreement with. Do you remember hearing about it and what happened around you? Was there celebration? We started getting uh, interested. They said that this is a new bomb. Uh, they didn't call it an atomic bomb, a new bomb that can really destroy a city. And, uh, and, it was, uh, and of course, then the second one, Naga, Nag Nagasaki. Uh, and uh, so we started thinking that this may be it. He, the Japan, you know, if the emperor had said to the Japanese people, fight on, they would have. And, uh, and Hirohito finally uh, agreed to end it all. You know, they looked upon him as a god, and whatever they, he told them, he, they would follow. Mm -hmm. So if we invaded uh, Japan, even though the, they had taken terrible losses before that, uh, you'd have the entire Japanese people against you, probably. Mm -hmm. So. And you were in Europe. Do you remember what some of your other soldier friends and um, perhaps the sergeants and other commanders felt? Was there celebration or just a Once the war ended, uh, Everybody shot off their uh, machine guns and rifles up in the air and And at that point, were you back uh, in France at that point? Yes. Uh, we ended up in the, uh, what became the f uh, British zone in Germany. You know, they, there were four zones in Germany, the American, the British, the French, and the Russian. The Russian zone became East Germany. And the other three zones became West Germany after a few years. So, but we had to get out. The British were coming in. And they moved us back to France. I, uh, I was sort of sorry because uh, the interesting thing, despite the pasting the Germans received, you could al al already sense that they're, they're cleaning up. You know, there's just rubble, but the streets are clean, the streets are back, and people are out. And, uh, and in a few years, Germany w was doing quite well. And they rebuilt in a few they, years. Yes, they did. Amazing. What do you feel were some of your greatest challenges while you were in combat? 
I think staying alive. <laughs> uh, I, uh, I grew up in North Adams. A lot of my friends uh, were comfortable with the, uh, rifles because they hunted. And I found hunting and fishing very boring. And uh, I used to go out with them, but I, I didn't care for it. Uh, to try to shoot a deer for sport, for the life of me, I couldn't, couldn't understand. If we had to have it for food, that's one thing, but for the sport of it. Uh, so where do I end up? But uh, as a rifleman, the M1 was the rifle. Uh, I learned how to take it apart blindfolded. Uh, they made you respect the rifle. If you dropped it in ranks, they made you sleep with it that night. Uh, and I did quite well on the, on the range, the firing range. Uh, I almost made expert <laughs> uh, because I did it the army way and, and a lot of other guys had developed bad habits while they were hunting and they brought those with them. Uh, but I haven't uh, handled a gun of any type since I left and I don't believe in it. But it is uh, in contrast to uh, that experience. Did you make close friends while you were in the service? I know you mentioned briefly that some friends were, were made, friendships were made in basic and then you departed. That was one of the problems. Uh, there were two people that I uh, corresponded with, Christmas card type thing. One lived in Connecticut and the other one lived outside of Buffalo. But we drifted away. In fact, I got a call two years ago from the guy in Connecticut. and. Uh, I don't know, really know why he called, but uh, uh, we talked and he said he was going to send me some literature. Uh, some, these divisions have uh, anniversary uh, get-togethers. Have you been uh, to any never, of those? No, I've never, mm. you know. Uh, it's a, the 75th was a National Guard unit yeah, out in, uh, from Missouri that was activated, nationalized, and sent over. In Massachusetts, we had one that went over to mm -hmm. 94th, I think. Uh, so, uh, you know, the, a lot of this cadre, so-called, were from the Ozarks in uh, mm -hmm. that end, the end of the world, down near Branson today. <laughs> right. So once you got back then to Le Havre, right. were you then shipped out on another ship yep. home? Yep to California or New York? New York. Mm -hmm. yep. What was it like coming into New York Harbor for you? Well, remember, the, the, uh, there certainly wasn't any welcoming party because it was a year after the war. I had been in the service uh, so, in such, uh, sh such a short period of time that the point system that they had established was such that I wasn't going to get home right away. It was based on your uh, months of service, your battle stars, your commendations, and uh, I did get two battle stars out of it. But I only had 28 points and uh, initially you had to have, I think, 100 to get sent home right away. So it was, it was June, the following June before. But I got to see, uh, went on leave to England. Mm -hmm. uh, we went back into Belgium and saw some of the, uh, and into Germany a little bit. I uh, went to southern France. Uh, so we did some traveling. Went to Paris quite a few times. There was a station not too far from Paris. So it wasn't a, a worthless year by any means. In that so you were in Europe for another year prior to coming home. Right. And what were your duties when the war was over? Well, this is of interest. I was sent to a German prisoner of war camp as part of the uh, Americans in charge. We didn't have to guard them. They had uh, Polish, uh, I think they were just, uh, you know, the, uh, the laborers brought in from Poland. They gave them a uniform and a rifle, and the Poles were happy to guard the Germans <laughs> under those circumstances. But I got to, every day for the winter of 44, or uh, 45, 46, uh, we had interpreters 
young German soldiers who could speak English. So I got to know them, uh, uh, you know, quite well. They, uh, you know, they were like anybody else as far as I, I could see. So were you helping to run the camps while the Yeah, there were only uh, ten of us, you know, it, in charge because we had all these poles. So you just oversaw the day-to-day? -day. Right. If we ever wanted to have a party, we had our own orchestra <laughs> that we'd call down, send the orchestra. <laughs> uh, and of course, we were waited on, uh, hand and foot, had all these Germans. One guy would wake us up, get up, sir, he'd say. Yeah. And uh, the, uh, so we lived quite well under the circumstances. The Germans uh, did two things. They manned the gas supply depot for the Allied forces in the area. And uh, they had a wood, uh, apparently was no coal, used wood to heat. And they stacked the wood that came in from uh, off trains. How many would have been in this particular camp? I'm trying to think. It wasn't huge. I'd say 500. Do you ever remember any of them trying to escape? Oh, yes. The Otto, the, our Batman, one morning wasn't there. He was what? A he Batman? Wasn't, well, Batman, in military terms, is the, the British always have their Batman who shines their shoes okay. and presses their pants and stuff like, like that. Like a valet. Like a valet, right. And uh, Otto was uh, nowhere to be found. And uh, he had taken an American vehicle and uh, left. It was found on the border between France and Germany, and he walked into Germany. Uh, but within a few months, they were all released anyway. Uh, but when I got home to North Adams, and I was uh, going to college, I went to Tufts, so that's how I ended up in Eastern Mass. Uh, a letter comes from Otto, <laughs> from Berlin. And <laughs> he must have taken all our addresses. And Otto, uh, Otto said, sir, we're no food here, no clothing, no shoes. Send us something, sir. I didn't. But I <laughs> so here he was a prisoner. Uh, an he escaped. escaped prisoner. <laughs> and yet he wrote to you. Yes. Have you ever been back to Germany no. or to Europe? I've been to uh, England, mm -hmm. but not the mainland. Mm -hmm. That's a goal someday to see it. So you came back home at this point in time, 20 years old, 21? I was 20. Yeah. And did you, in, did you sign up immediately to go back to school, or did you take some time off? Signed up immediately. Um, when you get home on June 26th, uh, you know, a lot, of, a lot of colleges were uh, full. In fact, uh, uh, my biology teacher in high school had gone to Hamilton College, which is in upstate New York, and he tried to get me in. And they said September of uh, 47, okay, but no openings. But then my cousin had gone to Tufts, and he got me to take the entrance exam. I got accepted, and uh, I'm down during freshman orientation, and a telegram came from Hamilton saying, there's an opening, am I interested in matriculating, was the chair. And I was already there, the die was cast. So. But so when you went to Tufts, what was your major? Uh, history. And you graduated in four years? Right, yeah, 1950. And then what? Then what? I was accepted to graduate school, uh, getting a master's at Tufts. And at that point in time, you used the f monies that your parents had saved for you? No, I had the GI Bill. Okay. which was uh, $75 a month, full tuition, and books. Uh, that would be uh, comparable to $20,000 today, a year. So. And in graduate school, did you get a master's in history? I got a master's in education. And was that a two-year program, or? Actually, only one year. One year. I do have an MA not an MED, because I did a uh, research paper, but it was only one year. And then did you go into the teaching? Yes, uh, that's how uh, I taught down in Foxborough for two years. 
and then the, the uh, junior high, they called it then, and got a position here in Natick, uh, the brand new high school that opened uh, in 1954. You the know, current the camp, high school. The current high school mm -hmm. campus. It was state of the art back then, I'll tell you. And uh, as a social studies teacher, and I was, I ended up going into guidance after th four years in the uh, classroom and spent two years in the guidance department at Natick High. And left after that, I got to be chairman of the department out at Algonquin Regional in, in uh, Northboro, Northboro and Southboro. And chairman was, of the guidance department? Right. Mm -hmm. And I was there from 62 to uh, 95 when I retired. <laughs> That's quite a history. Yeah. And yeah. when did you meet Mickey? Your, your wife? Uh, we were married in 54, the uh, summer before we uh, arrived in Natick. Uh, I met her at a uh, family function. We both have mutual relatives, but we're not related. <laughs> and, that's, and she had come to the family function as, uh, as I had. So you were single for quite a long time, yes? Let's see, in uh, 54, 28. Mm -hmm. but back then, that was, uh, yes, people were beginning to worry about me. <laughs> and at that point in time, did you settle in Natick when you, yeah. as soon as you got married? We had an apartment on, uh, right near the high school. Then we bought a house in 57 on Hartford Street and then moved to Barnsdale Road in 72. And, and since retirement, have you just relaxed and... I, uh, I, I try to keep active. There's a local tennis group uh, up at the Walnut Hill School, and they're mostly retired men. There are a few women. And I play with them on a regular basis. And uh, uh, I'm, a, I'm a reader. Uh, we only get three newspapers a day. <laughs> and I always have a book going. So, so the days go by. What do you think your feelings were, the feelings of your family were when you returned? I know you returned to North Adams for a short right. period of time. How, how was that going back to see well, family? Being an only child, you know, uh, the, uh, plus they had lost a son. Mm -hmm. He was three and a half when he died. Did they ever so, talk about that to you? No. Mm -hmm. no. Mm -hmm. uh, my mother would never come to the train station when I'd leave. My father would take me. But they were, you know, they were glad, you know, what are you going to do now? <laughs> so you just had to pick up from where right. you had left off. Growing up as a kid, my father's cigar business was fairly lucrative. People still smoked during the Depression. So I lived reasonably well. We always took a, a vacation. Went to Canada, went to Cape Cod, which was a pretty good distance from North Adams back then. And we certainly weren't suffering from abject poverty in my family household. However, it was around us. Uh, the story I always tell when I was in, uh, say, the fourth grade, so that probably would have been uh, 1934, uh, they would have a recess at this elementary school, as they do today, if the weather was good, you'd go out on the playground. My mother would give me an apple, and I started eating the apple, and I looked up, and there were three kids standing there waiting for the core. Oh. And it, I can't depict the effect of the Depression any, uh, mm -hmm. any better than telling that story, it seems to me. I don't, you know, uh, North Adams was a factory town, and uh, the best someone could do was share a position with uh, an, another employee. They work, you know, uh, rather than get laid off, they both would work 20 hours a week instead of 40. Mm -hmm. And they were on the edge, you know, all the time. So. How important do you feel um, it was to serve in the military? Okay, that's, uh, as far as World War II is concerned, uh, you know, uh, it was a war that 
we had to fight. I don't see how we could have avoided that. And it certainly was a war against evil. Uh, and uh, so I've always felt positive about uh, World War II. We had been attacked, we were in danger, and uh, I don't know if the Japanese could ever have landed troops on our shores or the Germans. Um, incidentally, I was listening in, on December 7, 1941, a friend and, and I were listening to a football game. <laughs> the New York Giants up there uh, were playing somebody. But we listened, we didn't watch, of course. And suddenly, a voice came on and said, we interrupt this program to announce that un unidentified planes have uh, bombed Pearl Harbor. And my friend said to me, where's Pearl Harbor? And I said, I think it's a, it's a naval base off the coast of, uh, uh, on the island of Cuba. <laughs> there is a naval base there, Guantanamo. Yeah. And so we realized, it, and we thought it was the Germans, mm -hmm. at least I did, until we found out it, 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 a few minutes later they came back and confirmed the fact that it was a Japanese, uh, you know. And you remember that vividly? Yes. You know, I was a sophomore in high school. Sure. And the war dragged on, uh, so. One of the other questions um, we ask our interviewees that I'd like to ask you now is to how you regard the public opinion, the difference of public opinion regarding the veterans of World War II, the Korean conflict, and the Vietnam War? Yeah. The, I was against the Vietnam War, to tell you the truth. Uh, from a military point of view, I felt it was the wrong war, the wrong time, and the wrong place. Uh, I didn't think it was necessarily an immoral war, but I didn't think it was the right place to send our young men uh, in a, a, a mountainous jungle against a very crafty foe when we were endangered. So, but in no way should that uh, be construed as, as I would ever say anything negative to a, a, a GI who fought in Vietnam. It, it's just our policy in Vietnam. Mm -hmm. Uh, that I opposed. You know, I thought they fought very well, very valiantly mm -hmm. under the circumstances. The other closing question that I have is, are there any th thoughts or memories or just comments that you would like to leave us with this afternoon that you could share not only with your family who will be viewing this tape, but also those who may be doing research in the future? Okay. Uh, as far as the family, I'm going to have copies made and, and, and send a copy to uh, each one of the uh, kids. You know, it'll be something nice when I move on. And uh, uh, it's, they, I'm sort of proud that I uh, fought in World War II because, as I say, it's a necessary war. I uh, certainly hope that this is it as far as major wars. Uh, my son w would be of the, the age, no children, so he would get uh, drafted in a war where conscription is uh, used. And uh, so I think we're very fortunate. We're very fortunate in this country to be living here. Drew Bledsoe, the quarterback of the Patriots, was on today. For some reason, they asked him about his grandfather. Uh, and his grandfather was a pilot, I think in the Pacific, I don't know what branch. And his wingman, that's the guy in his right wing, uh, was hit, the, the airplane was hit, and is going down. And he said, his grandfather said, get, a, get the parachute, get out. And he started to getting out and the parachute got caught on the plane. And the plane was going down with no, uh, with no parachute. Uh, and the, the guy pointed to the uh, stars and stripes on his shirt and went. So that said it all. Mm -hmm. We'd like to thank you this afternoon. Okay. This was a pleasure. Okay, very good, sure. <laughs>